Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve sallallahu ala seyyidina ve habibi kulubina ve şefi'i nüfusina ebel qasimi Muhammed. على لبيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, and sisters, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله as we commemorate the final night for the martyrdom of Imam As-Sadiq alayhi afdhal as-salati wa salam We'd like to conclude the topic for the three nights insha'Allah by first and foremost recapping it and insha'Allah finalizing it by talking in reference to the topic for tonight which is the non-visual aspect of becoming a better person, of becoming a better Muslim and a non-verbal aspect in reference, inshallah, to what we talked about yesterday, which was the physical characteristics and using your vocals, using your visual elements in order to become a better Muslim, in order to better preach Islam. So inshallah, as we talked about yesterday, when we looked at the specifics of how is it to go about elaborating and how, how we can go about discovering different methods to give or to preach the message of Ahlul Bayt, to preach the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. And we analyze that the important factors that we learn from our Imams, besides obviously the actual religion in itself, if we can pinpoint particular aspects that we want to learn and obviously teach, not only to the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, and not only to the other schools of thought, but to, to the whole world. Because when we take into aspect Ali ibn Abi Talib, when we take into aspect Imam Hussein alayhi afdhal salati was salam, when we look at these particular figures, the biggest injustice that we do as Muslims, the biggest injustice that we do as the followers of Ahlul Bayt is we cocoon them. We put them in the circle which is the Shia school of thought. However, if we look in actual fact, Ali ibn Abi Talib came for the whole world. Imam Hussein sacrificed himself and his household, so that, so that the whole world knows what he stood for, why he took that stance that he did. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Therefore, when we first and foremost look at these particular figures, and we analyze that they're not just for us as the followers of Ahlul Bayt, but for the entire world, and which can follow in their footsteps, follow in their sacrifices, follow in their knowledge, their morality, their discipline, their patience. And that's what we dis discussed yesterday. When we looked at communicating the school of thought, the first aspect is having all these, the knowledge, having morality, having the patience. Now that's one aspect we analyze what we need to have, what the Imams have, what we need to teach ourselves. Now the second level is, what allowed the Imams to become like that? As in, what can I do to achieve that? What can I do to elevate myself in this knowledge? What can I do to elevate myself in morality? How can I become a, per a person with better manners? How can I become a person with better patience? How is it that I can try to achieve that which Ali ibn Talib achieved. Why not? Because they are lights of guidance. They are role models. And the instant aspect with role models is that you want or you crave and you work towards being like them. You work towards achieving that which they achieved. And that's why they are role models. Because they haven't faulted. And that's the difference. When we look at Islam, when we put forth our role models, and not only in our reference as in, we don't have just the reference point as the Prophet of Islam. Our reference point is not just Ali ibn Abi Talib. Our reference point is not just Fatima al-Zahra and all our Imams after that. No. When we say reference points as the best characters in history, we tell the Jews, bring forth Moses. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. We tell the Christians, bring forth Jesus. Let's look at what your books say. Let's look at what the Quran says. 
Musa, there's miracles mentioned in the Quran that's not mentioned within the Torah. Isa, there's miracles upon miracles mentioned within the Quran. Particular values that we elevated Maryam alayhi afdal salati was salam that the Christians themselves don't have. As in bring any Christian and look at the Look at this aspect, look at the irony of this. When you bring forth any Christian, they will first and foremost, what would they say? They say, we believe Billah, that Jesus is the son of God, isn't it? They give him divinity. They say that he is God. He's a son of God and he's a God. The funny thing is in the Quran, we have a strong belief, but we never actually thought about it. The strong belief is when Isa was in his infancy, he spoke out, does it, doesn't he? When his mother is told, do not speak to the people that will attack you when you go back to Palestine. Don't speak. Just point at the baby. And the baby will speak. So she took a fast. When she fasted, they would accuse her. And accuse her and accuse her of that which is illegitimate. Every single time they'd speak to her, she would point at the baby. In which Isa ibn Maryam begins to speak. He says, I am the slave of God. He has, and it's in the Quran. The beauty is what? That we have that. But when you bring forth this miracle of Isa and you tell it to any Christian, they won't believe you. Why? The irony is that they believe he's the son of God. They elevate him in his rank. But can you see how much injustice they have done? The injustice is... That look at how great Isa was that they worshipped him. And that's why when people come and worshipped after Isa, the comparison is not just with Isa ibn Maryam. Even after Isa ibn Maryam, people came and worshipped Ali ibn Abi Talib. People came forth and worshipped Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where's the injustice in this? People think that they're elevating from the rank of Ali ibn Abi Talib. People came and the Christians thought that they're elevating from the rank of Isa ibn Maryam. However, they have the reverse effect. How great is the Lord of Isa and how great is the Lord of Ali ibn Abi Talib if they thought that they were great and they took them to be gods. But how great of a God if these people are his servants. That's what we have to look at. These people that people come forth and say they were gods, they were divine. They had miracles that we could not comprehend, therefore they must be divine. How great of a religion do we have? How great of a creator do we have if these people are his servants? That's what we have to look at. And how did they become? How did they achieve that which they achieved? Let's look at it because this is the communication aspect. How to communicate Islam. Number one, we know that we have a particular aspect that we have to achieve. And we mentioned it yesterday in, in detail. Knowledge, morality, and patience of the many that we have to achieve. But tonight we want to look at how to achieve that. As in when you look at the beauty of the Prophet of Islam, Al Habibul Mustafa Muhammad. Before Islam, as you know, he came out with the message at 40 years of age. In those 40 years, and look at the beauty of Islam, to give you an aspect of religiosity and character, go hand in hand. Because some people come forth and say, well, I'm religious. They pray, they fast, they read the Holy Quran, they memorize the Holy Quran. However, come look at their ethics. Come look at how, come look at how they treat their parents, treat their brothers. Let's look at their loyalty. Let's look at their tr trustworthiness, their truthfulness. And you find some people, that a lot of these are missing. Therefore, we want to analyze how is it to have a complete aspect, how to be a complete Muslim. The Prophet of Islam and the beauty that we don't look at is that before he came out and said that I am the Prophet of Allah, what, what was he known as? People used to call him by mor moral aspects that were attributed to him and him alone at the time. They used to call him As-Sadiqul Amin. They were moral grounds, moral characteristics of the Prophet of Islam. And the beauty is, people that didn't believe in him, they called him Sadiq al Amin. They said, You are the most truthful and the most trustworthy. But they still didn't come towards the religion. 
because it did not assist them in any way, or they didn't find it to be of any grounds that they may achieve any valuable items or achieve any, any ranks. However, look at the beauty of this. The kuffar, after, after 11 years that the Prophet went out with the message in Mecca, after 11 years, when Ali ibn Abi Talib slept in the bed of Rasulullah, when Rasulullah migrated, the beauty is, if we analyze the entire story, we often just look at Ali ibn Abi Talib when he slept in the bed of Rasulullah and he gave up his life so that Rasulullah's life will be extended, that he would be saved. However, we, we don't look at what other missions did Ali ibn Abi Talib have. One of them being what? One of these missions was, after you sleep in my bed, these are the amana of the disbelievers returned to them. Look at, look at the beauty of this narration. People wouldn't believe that the Prophet is the Prophet of God. They would just call him as Sadiq al Amin. They wouldn't believe that he is a Prophet. They wouldn't believe that he came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They wouldn't believe in the Quran. They wouldn't believe in Salah, Siyam, Zakah, nothing. However, they believed in his morality because they did not find anyone else more trustworthy to keep their amana with. They say, We disbelieve in you, but we believe that you are the most trustworthy. We disbelieve in you. But you are the most truthful. Look at the irony of it. Ali ibn Abi Talib goes back and he gives the amana to these people. Not to say that the Prophet ran away and he took the amana with him. He says, make sure you give these people their amanas. What they entrusted us, we are giving back to them before we migrate. That's the beauty I want to look at. That's the aspect I want to look at tonight. Is the morality, the inner self of a Muslim. How to achieve the inner greatness as in there's a lecturer by the name of Brother Ali. Ali al Najjar, he says a beautiful statement about Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, when you look at Ali ibn Abi Talib, we want to know how he lifted the door of Khaybar. How was he a lion in the battlefield? And he says a beautiful statement. He says, look at Ali, the servant. He says, because Ali was such a great servant to Allah at night, which made him a great warrior and a lion in the day. Therefore, we analyze that there must be something that happens behind closed doors that makes a person great. Something that happens where people cannot see that rehabilitates yourself, that you account for yourself, that you want to elevate yourself. When you do something good in one hand, and I don't mean you have to come out and show people what you do. Imam al-Sadiq, the person that we commemorate, he says, when you do something good in your right hand, make sure your left hand doesn't know. Nowadays, if someone does one thing that's good, he must tell every single person. Ramadan comes. People come forth. They leave everything behind. They begin to post up selfies of them in the mosque. They begin to post up selfies of them in Eid, etc. And as soon as Ramadan finishes, they're back to their old habits. Why? To get recognition. To show the people that, well, I'm religious. To show the people, well... And it's a massive trap that people may fall in, and that's the trap of Riyā, which eats away at our good deeds. It eats away, it burns them, as the narration states. So how is it that we can achieve greatness without having to show off, without having to show people of our greatness? What is it? How do we achieve this? And that's what we have to analyze because each and every one of us knows their own faults. I myself, I know that I have faults. And every single person has faults if they're not a ma'soom. But the largest door to enter for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the door of number one, tawbah. First we have to repent from our sins. We know what our sins are. We know what we lack in. And if we don't, we have to look towards our friends. The people that the imams say they have to be a mirror. The mu'min have to be a mirror towards his brother. Make sure you go towards them. If you don't know what's fault in yourself, ask them, tell them, what is the fault with me? What do you think I have to better? What do you think I lack? How is it that I may better myself? Now, there's one aspect I want to look at tonight because there's many aspects. We can look at the aspect of Riyadh. 
in more depth. We can look at the aspect of ghira, envy towards other people. And it's a disease, all these are diseases that we need to be looked at. The aspect of ghira, envious towards another person. The aspect of backbiting. The aspect of traveling with particular wordings and it's called namime, taking one particular wording and moving the word. Even though if the wording is correct, even though the happening is correct, but that transition of information to people that it shouldn't get to, even if it's true. These are all diseases. Disrespect towards the parents. Disrespect towards society. Disrespect towards Allah. And that's the biggest trap that each and every one of us fall into. When we sin, and that's the, that's the amazing thing. When we sin, we know for a fact that we are sinning against the Lord of the creation. Imam Zain Abidin says, don't look at who you're sinning. Don't look at the size of the sin. Because look at us. We think, oh, if this is a little lie. Well, I'll look at this person a little longer than I'm supposed to. I'll do this particular act of haram. No one's watching. I'm behind closed doors. Imam Zain Abdi says, don't look at the size of the sin, if it's small or big. Look at who you're sinning against. The people on the 10th of Muharram, they thought that they were doing great justice. They thought to themselves that there's a Khalifa of the time, and he told us to go kill Imam Hussein. People didn't look at it as a sin. They thought they're doing great justice to the world. And this is the trap that we can fall into if we keep choosing the wrong path in the small aspects that Allah puts us into perspective. If we keep choosing wrong when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us in a small perspective, then it will build up and build up and build up until what? Until a time the big decisions come and you've been choosing wrong for long enough, then you'll choose wrong even in the big decisions. And that's the trap that we may fall into. There's stuff that we may overlook, but it has a vital aspect towards our life. As in the 10th of Muharram, when there was armies on one side and armies on the other. 30,000 on one side and the handful, 72 on the other, companions fighting against one another. Imam Sadiq is asked, the person that we commemorate, he's asked, he says, why was there an adhan on one side of an army and a jama'ah prayed? And then Adhan on another side of an army and a Jama'ah prayed. It's got to do with rehabilitating yourself. It's got to do with purifying your inner self before your outer self. Imam Sadiq says, Muli'at butunahum min al-haram. He says, their stomachs have been full of that which is unlawful. Now, whether it be through financial aspect, whether it be through the sacrificing of animals being halal and haram, that's a different argument altogether. But... That also can be taken into the concept of what? Of replenishing yourself, reviving yourself, cleaning yourself, perfecting yourself. Now the topic I want to look at tonight is a topic that people associate with the female. However, it has a bigger depth even in the male perspective. And that's the aspect of hijab. Because what I said tonight is we want to look at the aspect of the inner beauty of perfecting oneself so it will show. Because what you do, what you perfect within yourself, morality, when you know, when you educate yourself, do you apply it? Because there's two aspects, two scales. One scale is knowledge and another scale is belief. Many a time, people have the knowledge, elevated knowledge, not any knowledge, not someone like me that would have. I have nothing in comparison to these people that have this knowledge. But some of them don't have the application, don't have the belief. When you apply your knowledge, it means it's belie you believe in that which you have. If you have knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you for a particular act. If you have belief, would you go towards that act? You wouldn't go towards that act. If we had belief... That Imam Mahdi Sharif was watching us and our a'mal are written, are given towards him every Friday. Would we do that which Imam would look at and say, this is not my follower? 
Or would we make sure that we do that which Imam Mahdi looks at when he looks into our books of A'mal and says this, I'm proud to have this as a follower. And that's the beauty. Knowledge is not enough. Application. When we talk about hijab in the male perspective, and inshallah I'll move on to the female perspective and I'll conclude my lecture for tonight. When we look at the male perspective in the Quran, if you look at the timeline in which the Quran narrates towards the concept of hijab, we look first and foremost, it's applied to the male before the female. It says to the male, make sure you lower from your gaze. Doesn't it? The Quran tells the male, lower from your gaze. Now why does it say lower from your gaze? Because we don't want to look at the social aspects of it. Let's look at the aspect of how it inflicts damage within ourselves. When we look at that which is unlawful for the first time, Allah says, when you look the first time, it's for you. You look away. It doesn't mean you look for 50, 20 seconds or 20 minutes. No, 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 no. It says the first time you see that which is unlawful, you move away. The second look becomes haram. It becomes against you. The first look for you, the second is against you. And thus, if you look a second time, that's why we have to begin to rehabilitate ourselves. That's how we replenish ourselves. Everything is a test. When Allah puts something in front of you, which yourself says, I want, I want, I want. And nafs al-ammara it tells you what? Look at it. It won't affect you. It's beautiful. You know, let's look at it as a particular gender, for example. You see a beautiful girl. You see her first time. You're like, wow. What's a creation? You say, and your nephew says, you know what? My brain says, look away. I look away. My nephew says, no. Look again. It's beautiful. It's Allah's creation. People come forth and say, well, you know what? If I remember Allah, it'll be so much better. And then he has the subhan and says, subhanallah, subhanallah. We laugh about it, but what's, what's the aspect? Is that when we give in to our inner self, when we give in to that thing which tells us, look at that which is haram, on one aspect, on the second, third, fourth, fifth time, it becomes easy. Imam Sadiq has a statement in which he says, the first time you perform a sin against Allah, it's as if a boulder has hit you. It's a massive aspect when you first sin against Allah. It's a massive thing on your shoulders. You're remorseful, you're regretful. You want to repent straight away when you do it. However, when you do it on more than one occasion, the second time, it becomes less heavy of a boulder. The third, fourth, fifth time, the tenth time, you become desensitized. When you look at that which is haram, you'll become desensitized. You won't even think of it as haram. It'll be second nature. You'll be thinking to yourself, well, it doesn't affect me anymore. And that's the danger. That's where the danger comes into perspective. When you ask, and this is... This is just an example. It's not saying that smoking is a bad thing in essence. It does harm your body. But we're not putting it as the same level as disobeying Allah. But I want to give you the example. When we look at smokers, you go and ask a smoker, how is it that you started? Some people may remember how they started to smoke. Other people may not remember whatsoever. But when you look at the aspects, the way in which a person begins, the first time you can imagine, and I've spoken to particular people that are chain smokers now. They said back when we were at high school, some people even go back when it was primary school. He says, we wanted to be cool. We wanted to hang out with those people that were looked up towards in the social circles and the school grounds. He says, I used to follow them outside. And this is males and females. And that's the danger. He says, we used to follow them outside. When we'd follow them outside, the cool group would smoke. And they'd tell me, why don't you try? He says, the first time, I said, no, no, no way. What if my parents found out? It has negative effects. It's dangerous. It's bad for you. He says, the more I hang out with these people, the first level is, no, just hold it for us. The third level would be what? Just have one puff. The fourth level would be just, just smoke one cigarette. It's not going to affect you. And day after day, it's Elevated and elevated and elevated until what? That became that person became a chain smoker. Where does it start? 
The first time he went with those people, when he, when he had, if he had people around him that told him that, no, this is bad for you, do not hang out with that. When he saw the danger of the smoke on the first level and he stepped away, would he have been a chain smoker? Food for thought, isn't it? When we go toward that which is sinful on the first aspect, and our mind and our religion says, look away. When our nefes says, look back. When we look back the first time, it will become a second, a third, and a fourth. And that's the danger I want to look at. Because it imprints onto our soul. When we read Quran, when we listen to Quran, when we listen to Ahlul Bayt's poetry, when we listen to the great poets that we have, such as Mulla Basim al karbalai when we look at all the great people that have come forth, when we listen to what they say, when we listen to Quran, when it infuses in our soul, it's different than listening to music. What kind of effect does listening to the Quran have on our souls? When we look at religion, when we look at person that's upbringing their child, when the child's still in the womb of their mothers, we know there's an effect. When you read Quran, the narrations come forth and tell us, if you read Surah Yusuf on a bunch of apples, and you eat it, the baby becomes beautiful. Where's, where's the? Can you actually come forth and say, well, there's a scientific evidence that if you read Surah Yusuf, it has a beautifying aspect. But we know why, because our Imam says so. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 1,400 years ago, He gave us the Qur'an. And in it are signs that will not be discovered until the right time and the right technology comes forth. There's one depth that me and you think that we have. But there are depths upon depths of the Qur'an that only the infallible can decipher and teach us. And that's the beauty and on the first level, we have to first and foremost prepare ourselves. When we have all these things, there's so many aspects that we can perfect ourselves in. Instead of listening to the music that only portrays a certain aspect, which is all sinful, all unlawful, those which they try to preach within their songs, try to subconsciously put in your mind. And on the flip side, Allah has given us the best of the best. The Quran, which it has Allah's signs that you listen to. People are mesmerized from. People came towards the religion of Islam in the time of Jahiliyyah by listening to the words of Allah. And nowadays we go towards that which our nafs leans towards. Because society tells us to lean towards it. Our friends tell us to lean towards that. Abu Fadl al-Abbas has a beautiful statement. And it's attributed to Abu Fadl al-Abbas. He says, I have a brother. Other people come forth in history and attributed to other people. Abu Fadl al-Abbas in a narration, he says, I had a brother. When two different aspects came in front of him, if two different choices came in front of him, both were lawful, both were halal. Two different choices. He says how he used to manage himself, how he used to perfect himself, is he has to look at the two different decisions. He'd say, I have this aspect and this aspect. He says, I look at myself. Which one do I crave towards? Which one does myself crave towards? He says, I wouldn't choose that. I would choose the other. Why? He says, so he can build himself, replenish himself. Make sure he goes against that which he desires. To perfect yourself, to perfect yourself, to perfect yourself. It says, make sure. That's when Allah says something that what you want and what you please will be intertwined with what Allah wants. That's what Ahl al-Bayt were. When Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I achieved that which I achieved. Why? He says, I used to see how Allah would be before, during and after that particular act. If Allah was happy before, I do it. If Allah is happy within, I'll do it. If Allah is happy after, that's why I did that particular act. Because I always have the knowledge of Allah and how Allah is viewing that particular act. And that's what we have to instill within ourselves, brothers and sisters. That's what we have to look at. That's how we perfect ourselves. Go against that which we 
are pleased to go towards, go against that which our nafis tells us to go against Allah. We have to make sure we have to replenish that particular nafs to get it time after time. It will not begin to go towards that which is haram. If you show it the beauty of that which is halal, if you learn as an, as an aspect, for example, hijab, if you learn the beauty of hijab, would we have sisters that want to hold on to that which is unlawful? Would we have sisters wanting to go against the very faculty of hijab? We wouldn't. If someone knew exactly what hijab was, people outside the region of Islam know what hijab is and the beauty. And that's what knowledge comes into practice. If we know the beauty of that particular ibadah, the beauty of that particular worship, will be inclined towards it. That which we please will be intertwined with that which Allah pleases. A person comes forth and this woman is a revert. She wasn't from Islam. She says, I would see the scarfed ladies. I would see these Muslims that were wearing the scarf. And I was always enlightened. I always wanted to know more and know more and understand. He says, at a time, every single woman I'd ask that was wearing the hijab, I'd ask, why is it that you wear the hijab? What is the beauty behind it? What's the theory behind this hijab? Can you tell me why you are wearing it? She says, the revert. She says, she says, nine out of ten didn't know an answer. Nine out of ten, this woman is in America. She says, nine out of ten people that I have asked, the sisters that wear the hijab, did not have an answer as to why she wore the hijab. She says, one of them out of the ten would know comprehensively why she wore the hijab. But why 9 out of 10? Therefore, we know there's a lack of knowledge, of ma'rifah of the hijab. Why do we not teach? Why do we not learn? Why Fatima al-Zahra wore the hijab? Why Sayyida Zainab upheld the hijab even after the tragedy of Karbala? Why Imam Hussein had such an emphasis on his daughters on the 10th of Muharram for the hijab? This woman says, I went out. She says, nine out of ten people couldn't give me a sufficient answer. She says, I went out and I went to learn about this hijab. She says, do you know what I learned from this hijab? This woman is now a Muslim and a muhajjabah. And she wears the best hijab, the shari hijab, that which covers the contour lines. She says, when I went to research, I came with the conclusion that one thing and one thing only led me towards the hijab of Islam. is the inner beauty of the hijab. She says, what is it? As in, is the beauty. When we look at someone doing something beautiful, helping a stranger, being honest, being truthful, being trustworthy. Can someone come forth and tell you, well, I'm trustworthy? Wallah, I'm truthful, believe me. Wallah, I help the people in need. You see that from the ishra, from other people talking about that person. It comes to your attention. You see it on someone. If someone comes to tell you that, well, I'm such and such, it doesn't, it's not that aspect. He says, the beauty of the hijab of Islam is that it dictates that. The beauty of the hijab of Islam is when she says, and this sister called herself Amin after she reverted. She said the beauty of the hijab is it tells people at the first instance that when you look at the person that's a muhajjabah, you know that that person is truthful. You know that that person is trustworthy. You know that that person has morality, has patience, has ethics, has role models that they keep in hold of. At the first level, do you know that person? No. Do you know that person? No. She's a Muslim. She says, because she's a Muslim, because she wears that veil, automatically I associate these characteristics with that particular person. And that's the beauty of it. That's one of the beauties of the hijab. The inner beauty. All these characteristics are what the sisters are aiming to go towards. Are what the sisters wanting to achieve. And that's what Sayyida Zainab and Sayyida Fatima are our role models for. To look at these particular moral characteristics and to perfect them. And I end on one story. There was a woman by the name of Krista Brima. 
Christian. Her daughter once, because she had a Muslim husband, her daughter once bought a hijab. She was nine years of age. She says, when my daughter wore the hijab, she says, I was embarrassed. It's a long story, but I need to cut it short, inshallah, to end for tonight. Long story short, one day in the marketplace, she bought the hijab because she was embarrassed. She comes back home, she finds her daughter, the nine-year-old, puts the hijab on and wanting to go to school. She said, from the waist down, I recognized my daughter. I knew that's my daughter, yes. She says, but from the waist up, I had no idea that it was my daughter. It was the first time I saw her wear the hijab. But look at the beauty of this woman's words. A non-Muslim, she said, suspended. She's, she's trying to imagine and give us a metaphor of what she saw. She said, suspended in black cloth, I saw a moon in a starless sky. She says, that's how I viewed my daughter's face within the hijab. She says, I saw the beauty of the hijab when I took her to school and everyone was associating whether they were wearing the right clothes, the right fits, how they looked, how their hair was, were they wearing the right colors, the right fashion statements, etc. She says, but when my daughter went in, I knew then and there that my daughter won't look into these materialistic aspects and she will work on her character, her inner self, perfecting and purifying her inner self if she wore the hijab. She says, then and there, she goes and writes a book. She says, what offers more freedom, the bikini or the headscarf? And she goes with the headscarf. She says, the headscarf offers more freedom. And I end on this note, brothers and sisters. And insha'Allah, we learn from the teachings of Imam al-Sadiq. We learn from the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. The message that the Prophet of Islam came to perfect. And first and foremost, perfecting our inner self. Achieving that which is great. Achieving that which will make Imam Sahib al-Asri was zaman happy with our actions. Happy with our achievements, our goals. We need to set them and work towards them. We pray to Allah that he allows us to achieve these goals that we set for tonight. We ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this blessed night to allow Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman to be happy with that which we, each we want to strive to become towards. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we pray towards him that he may elevate our ranks in which we will be raised as one of the 313, as one of the ashab of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman with the Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha, but before the three of your loudest salawat, ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.